Shall we open our Bibles this morning? We finished the book of Hebrews last week, and uh, this week we are starting the book of James, the book of James. And in the book of James, we find these words, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed according abroad uh, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials. Um, James is, most people feel, is the half-brother of Jesus. And James, in the time of Jesus' ministry from his childhood, through his baptism, when he gained a public ministry, uh, he did not believe or follow uh, Jesus, his half-brother. And uh, it it tells us in Mark, actually, that he went with his mother to get Jesus and haul him off because they said he's gone crazy. He's losing his mind, and we've got to go put him in the equivalent today of an insane asylum. We've got to take Jesus and get him out of this He's gone over the edge, and we must reel him in. It's my responsibility as his brother to bring him in. And then we see in John chapter 7 where James is actually telling Jesus sarcastically, hey, if you're who you say you are, why don't you go publicly and announce it and uh, see what happens. You ought to go down during the festivals and the feast, and you ought to go down during the Passover, and you ought to just say who you are. And Jesus said no, and, but he, he showed up in, in a kind of a secret way. And so his brother did not believe in Jesus. He did not follow Jesus. And so we find a person who is now uh, a leader in the church, the early church. In Acts 12, 17, and, and in chapter 15, we see that he becomes the pastor in Jerusalem as Peter kind of moves off the scene as time goes by. James becomes the leading pastor in Jerusalem. It's him that's really handing down the consul's decision in Acts chapter 15. And so as we look at the half-brother of James, we see that God has done something in his life. And I think that this is a good note for us, especially on a day when we dedicate a child, is the fact that this child is, not, is born into sin. And this child, because he's raised in a Christian family, is not a believer. He has to choose that for himself. And every child has to choose that for themselves. You can do your best. You can raise your child uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and according to the Word. You can live out your life yourself. But you know what? It's your children's own decision. And you cannot make that decision for them. Jesus was there, he, he did miraculous things, and yet his brother did not believe. It was one day, though, however, after the resurrection of Christ, that Jesus appeared to his kid brother. We read about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that he, uh, he appeared to his brother, and from that point on, he became a follower of Jesus Christ. And I like the choice of his words here. Look at Verse 1 with me again. James, he's a bondservant of God and of my kid brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever think about that? Following someone that you grew up as just a chump and now you realize that God has gotten a hold of that person's life and recognizing them in a new and different way. And here we have James, the half-brother, who is not just going along and saying, hey, you know, I'm in this family, there's this large following, I might as well get in on the action and get some money for myself and make this thing pay off for me. It's somebody who did not believe, who was against Christ, who was suddenly transformed and turned around because Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. And so we have uh, people today. Um, Some of you here today might believe that you're okay with God because you were raised in the Christian uh, faith. That is not the case. You must choose for yourself. And you suddenly own your faith when you get a chance to prove your faith, when it's being tested. And so I think that James, the half-brother of Jesus, gets to prove his faith, and then he turns around and he becomes a minister to other people to prove, to, to speak to them about how that their faith, in order to be real and realized in a personal way, has to be tested. It has to be proven. 
And so he's writing to these people. He's, the date of this book is kind of interesting. Uh, there are different people believing the dates are different, but it is before the Jerusalem Council. It's before the, um, before the, the big blow-up of the Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. Yes, we'd had uh, Cornelius in his house in chapter 10, uh, and we had seen that, that James was a part of the early church. He was in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell on the church. Uh, he takes kind of a backseat to Peter initially, and then he's raised up, and Peter is, is commissioned on the roof with a vision to go to Cornelius' house, who is a Gentile. And there, while he is, it's against his will, it's against everything he believes, God leads him into something that, that is so much bigger than Peter sees. And God pulls this surprise, and these Gentiles come to faith, and it's proven by the gift of the Holy Spirit falling upon them, as he had uh, uh, in, in chapter 2, when the, church, when the Holy Spirit fell on the early church. And the manifestation of gifts began to flow out of these Gentiles. And they said, what is this? We've not seen the Holy Spirit poured out on Gentiles. And so we see that they were surprised. And so it's just kind of breaking in. But from Acts chapter 8, we see that there is a great persecution because Stephen is being stoned. And from that persecution in Acts chapter 8, this persecution erupts and people who have been in the city of Jerusalem and who have been getting disciples, giving themselves to the apostles' teaching and to doctrine and breaking bread, eating together and and uh, praying together and growing, and the Lord was adding to their number daily. As all these people came into Jerusalem for the Passover, and 50 days after that, they hung out for the, the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And here are all these people from all over the world gathered, and the, the gift of God is poured out, and tongues is being spoken, and people are listening to people praise God in a language that they've never learned. And they said, what could this mean? Well, some said, well, they're drunk, as you suppose, you know, with wine. And others said, what is this? This is not drunkenness. It's only nine in the morning. But God sent a, a, a message through the apostle Peter. And he stood up and he preached from Joel. This is the outpouring that was promised of the Holy Spirit. So James is like catching on. He's not there yet. As a matter of fact, some people believe that this book is not... Um, it shouldn't be in the canon. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther, if you ever uh, do any reading from Martin Luther, he didn't like this book. He didn't think it was inspired because it's not the gospel of grace that he's talking about because that hasn't really been seen yet. It's like Jewish Messiah um, believing in Jesus as your Messiah, Messianic Judaism to him. And who is he writing to? He's writing to the 12 tribes. He's writing to Jewish believers. He's not writing to Gentiles. And therefore... Martin Luther, and because it, it's, uh, he, James gets into, like, show me your faith by what you do. Martin Luther said it's justification by faith, and we should throw this book out. So it's a kind of a controversial book, and some would say that it's, it's much like an Old Testament book in the way it, it carries itself. And others say, you know, it's almost like his half-brother is interpreting the Sermon on the Mount in very practical ways. So as we open this book together in the next few weeks... We're going to see some things that come out of something of, of a person who was not a believer who becomes a believer and his life is transformed and now he's going to even pay the price. Many people believe that James was martyred for his faith. And so we want to look at this and we want to look at the price. We're going to look at, at the life of a man who has been turned around, who has been transformed, who has seen his failure of recognition of his brother to become who he really says he is. Now, I am a bondservant of my brother, Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but sibling uh, rivalry is, is, a, is a big thing. And James is saying, I am a bondservant of my big brother, Jesus Christ. And he is the son of God. And I'm going to be out there with how I believe about my half-brother, Jesus. And so he's going to put himself out there in such a way that he's going to eventually, um, as tradition says, will be martyred for his stance. And so we look at this person. We look at a person who's been changed. We look at a person who has missed God, who has now found God, who now writes from that perspective. And I think it's going to offer us something as we study this book 
of how people miss God, recognize God, and how that turns around for them in their ability to minister to other people who have missed God. So James is a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, and he says, greetings. Now, some of you who were at Jerusalem and saw the outpouring of the Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit has driven you out. And I find it interesting, by the way, and this is a side note, because I'm studying, we're studying the book of Acts in uh, our class uh, on Tuesday morning. And uh, I was finding interesting that Jesus, in chapter 1, meets with the 12 uh, apostles, and he says to them, he says, uh, hey, uh, I'm going to go, and it's okay. And they're, they're dialogue, dialoguing with him and said, now is it at this time that we get our 12 thrones and the kingdom is restored to Israel? And, and Jesus said, you know, it's not for you to know times and dates, but here's the clue. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. And you will be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and where? The ends of the earth. So I look at this scattering and I'm thinking, you know, this is just unfortunate that this persecution arose and people are suffering. And we look at events today, you know, you, you, and I don't mean to interpret and I don't understand the Somalia, um, uh, the earthquakes and all that's happening in parts of the world and thousands of people losing their lives and people being rearranged. But I can tell you the last time uh, in Sumatra, we, we are close to that because um, we buy coffee uh, from there. And we were having a hard time getting coffee because the ports, it wasn't the coffee farms, they were up high, but we couldn't get the coffee from Sumatra uh, shipped out. And so we followed this thing. And you know what? It was really cool because there's this Muslim stronghold there. And for, for, for the event of, of, the pers- of what had happened, this tragedy, Christians were suddenly allowed to go in and rebuild. So, we, you know, when you see something... In your life, you don't like it. It's not comfortable. It's, it's, it's really uh, disheartening. It, don't worry. When you give your life to God, there's something that's, that's being accomplished in your life through the pain. God never wastes pain. He never wastes suffering. In the life of his children, he's going to accomplish something through everything that you go through. And, and that's the joy of following Christ. And here's a man who had missed God, had Missed the day of visitation. J- just think of this. God became flesh and dwelt in this guy's house. But it was so common that he missed it. And now he's writing to people who have been scattered everywhere. And they're upset. Their lives are torn apart. They're, they're suffering. And, and it's not good. And what do you say to people who are paying the price? Now that they're believers and they go back to their synagogues and there's, they're being kind of isolated, well, they're one of those Jesus Jews. And so, you know, don't buy from them. Don't hire them to fix your roof. Kind of being outcast and paying the price. And yet God was at work. I find it interesting that the 12 apostles who Jesus commissioned to go into all the world to the ends of the earth are now where? They're staying in Jerusalem. But who's going? It's a lay movement, folks. It's lay people. It's people like you. It's people like me. You know? I just consider myself someone that's just called but very ordinary. And I, I, I like that. And I hope that you like that about yourself. That God could use you. And so these 12 tribes are being scattered and the witness of God is going with them. And so what, what they feel has been really wrong and they, they could harbor justified resentment. This is not fair. We have been driven out of Jerusalem to our, from our nest of nurture. And now we've found ourselves all over scattered just to avoid the persecution. And wherever we go, we're labeled. This Jesus one has saved our soul, has caused our life to be hard, but yet we follow him. And he writes to these people. And he writes these words. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And let him ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. But let the brother of humble circumstance glory in his high position. And let the rich man glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with the scorching wind, and withers the grass, and the flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. In the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord, the righteous, uh, the in which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James begins to say, now you're under trial, you're being scattered abroad. And here's the attitude that I want you to have, joy. I want you to have joy in the midst of being disheartened, in the midst of being persecuted, in the midst of suffering. The attitude that you should have is that of joy. Life is hard. Now, I think it's kind of weird um, Jesus is in the garden, and he's about to undergo the biggest trial of his life. He's going to go on the cross, and worse than that, he's going to experience separation from the Father as the sins of the world are poured out on him, and God has to look away, and it becomes dark in the middle of the day, and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? And we watch Jesus prepare for this time, and he knows what's coming down the pipe for him, and he knows that this is the trial of his life. And he's, he's, he's over there and he's got his disciples and he's calling them and says, come and pray with me. Come and stay, get with me here. And he begins to pour out his soul and he's, he's sweating drops of blood. The capillaries of his, of his face in his face are breaking. And I don't know if you've had news that is so, so unusual to you that your lips become numb and begin to tingle and your blood pressure goes way up. But that's what's happening with Christ. And he's sweating drops of blood. And he wakes up and here's his disciples who he's really counting on for emotional support. And they're all asleep. And he turns to them and says, can't you pray with me one hour? And they wake up, oh yeah, we're, we're with you. And he goes and he prays again. And they fall asleep. And three times he, he goes to the Father and says, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not what I want, it's what you want. And he's wrestling with God. He's trying to get to the point of surrender. But somewhere in the point of surrender, something happens within the heart and the life and the mind of Jesus Christ in that garden. And the final battle was won at that moment. It's when he could surrender himself to the will of God. And as he begins to pray and pour out uh, to God, something happens to him on the third time. Because Hebrews tells us, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. So there are things that are coming at you, and you're not to just say, oh, praise the Lord, you know, it's like half-heartedly. No, you're supposed to kind of not welcome it, but work through it until you can embrace it. Until then, you get a vision of the bigger picture of what's going to come out of your suffering, and then that's when the joy comes. I see too many of us trying to pretend to walk this out without wrestling with God. And I believe it's, it's healthy. I believe it's good. I believe it's, it's, it's a process in which everyone should go through and surrendering and letting go and taking it back and letting it go and taking it back until you can get to the place where God gives you the big picture. Hey, let me show you what I'm going to bring out of this. And here's a whole church of Jews and Gentiles, too many to count, that are before the throne of God because of Jesus' surrender. And Jesus said, you know what? It's worth it. I will go to the cross for these people whom I love. And I will go, not begrudgingly, I go because I love them. And the, 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 there's joy in my heart because I see these people. And I want to connect with them. I love them. And I will accept 
what's coming to me, even though I do not deserve it. I will embrace it. I will take it. And because of that, uh, I have now a joy about going to the cross. And it was at the point when Jesus received his joy that he was able to walk toward the cross without looking back. And I know that life is difficult for you and me, and I know that life sometimes just seems like it sucks and it's totally not fair. I know that there are times when you're in the right. And no matter how right you are, that's not the way it's going to go. And you should get in God's face about that like the psalmist, like Jesus. And you should wrestle that through, and you should come out of that until you get this sense of like, hey, this is what God's going to do out of this. And there's something about getting the big picture as a revelation from God. Now, I, I don't mean to get real super spiritual here, because revelation can come in a very natural way, or revelation can come through dreams or visions or whatever. And whatever God wants to do to push you through that time to where you get the big picture, and you're able at that point to embrace that trial. When you get to that place, you're going to meet God, and God's going to walk with you right in through into the fire with you. And I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they wouldn't bow down and worship the false gods. And when they were called on it, they wouldn't budge. And when they were thrown in the furnace, they wouldn't burn. And as they looked in the furnace, there was one who was like the Son of God. And Jesus was right in there with them. And I will tell you that life has many trials to offer you. But when you understand who God is, when you get the big picture of what God wants to do, that God is not bad, he wants to bring something good out of injustice. He wants to bring something good out of, in Peter's case, his own failure. He wants to bring something good out of hardships, out of being maligned. When you know who God is and when you understand how it is that God works in your life, you get taken out of your microvision and you get the big picture. And suddenly something comes into your heart and begins to fill your soul. It's called joy. Because you know that somehow God is not wasting this hardship. He is not wasting this trial. He's not wasting this sorrow. He's using it. And if you embrace this sorrow, God's work will be realized in your life. Now, what is the purpose of trials? The purpose of trials is seen in verses 3 through 4. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. I like the words knowing that. Our faith is tested in order for you to gain knowledge, knowledge of who God is and knowledge of who you are and how God walks with you. Knowing that, I like those words. You really don't know who God is until you've proven who God is. Until Jesus jumps out of the storybook of what you've been raised in, until he jumps out of the storybook into your life story, you'll never know that you know that you know until you go through a testing. And so faith is, is tested in order for you to gain knowledge of God. I, I find myself continually thinking I know God, and then I find myself in a new trial. And I, I realize, you know, I, I really do not know what to do or how God's looking at me or the situation or whatever, and I don't know God. I don't know how to respond. And because of that, I, I'm pressed into God, and I go to him, and I ask for wisdom. And through the trial, I get a new perspective, a new knowledge of who God is. You can't really just know God. You can know God from just studying. But you really know God intimately and personally when the study and the knowledge is plowed into your life. I find it interesting, farming techniques. I, I went to, Judy and I went home, and it was her mother's birthday, and we had a great 
time with her mother and her father. And uh, it was really good. I, I really enjoyed it. We even went on an early morning hike. And her father's like 75, and I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. You know, and he's like up ahead talking and going, and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, he, you know, I'm really out of shape. And uh, we're having a great time, and I'm at the Fonts reunion uh, in, at noon, and then it's her mother's birthday party at 2. So we had this 24-hour whirlwind uh, tour of Peoria uh, the last uh, day. And, uh, and I realized that... Um, I don't know where I was going with this. I realized that I don't know where I was going. Farming, Farming thank you. All of my family are, um, for the most part, are farmers. The Fonts, the Fonts were Holstein farmers, and some of them raised hogs. And my dad was not a farmer. And, but I, I realized as a little boy, uh, about Otto's age, because I was into stuff, uh, my uncles and grandfather quickly realized that I could be really taken care of and babysat really well if they just pulled out their Oliver or Super M, you know, farm all, and they parked it right there where everyone could see me. And I would sit on the tractor for three hours, and I knew I was going to grow up to be a farmer. And uh, I'm not. Uh, and I, I'm glad. Um, but I realized that I grew up in a farming culture. But the farming culture in the Middle East is so much different than the farming culture here, where you have, uh, you know, 25 rows being planted at one time with computers. If one kernel doesn't go down, it comes up on the computer, and it's so high tech, you know. But in the Middle East, it's, Jesus talks about a sower who would go out to sow, and the, the seed would fall in different places. But farming as we know it um, from... Middle Eastern point of view, it's like the seed is sown, and then the plow comes and plows it under. It's almost like the story comes in the knowledge, the basic knowledge about God and God loving you so much that he would die for you, and that's all Sunday school stuff that you learn, you know, David and Goliath and crossing the Red Sea and how God does what God wants to do to fulfill his purposes, and, you know, I think that's all neat. My, my grandson came back, and, and uh, there was a dead animal, and my, my daughter's trying to show him about death, and and uh, my wife tells this story much better than I. But, uh, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, Otto, the, the, the little animal's not going to be back tomorrow. It's gone. It's dead. It, it's, you know, it dies. And he doesn't understand death. And he's trying to learn. And he says, and, and you know, everybody's going to die and stay dead, my daughter told me. And he says, no, except God. <laughs> and, and, and he's only been to Sunday school here a few times. And, and so... Uh, and so he said no because um, they, they took God and they glued him to a T. And they put screws in his hands so he couldn't get off. But he came back to life three days later. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Um, so I don't know what you Sunday school teachers are teaching in your class. It must be that you glued something uh, on paper. Uh, you glued him to a tree. And you, I, don't, I hope you're not using screws. But uh, thank you for teaching, and I, I love how it's coming back. But I, I, realize, I realize very much that truth that you have that hasn't been tested is really not really owned by you in a, in a deep way. Are you with me? And so he's writing to these people, and they're, they're in misfortune. They're scattered. They're being persecuted. And in the midst of their persecution, he says, hey, be happy, be joyful. Why? God's doing something in this. He's testing your faith. And he's doing it so that you can know God personally, not just theoretically from a book, but you may know God personally and prove the word true in your very own life. Not just in the pages, but jumping out of the pages into your life and showing you who God really is. And then you can know God. Knowing, I love this, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Our faith is tested to reveal, to prove whether it's real or not. I, uh, I love it because um, I, I came up with a concept for a brewer, and I took it to Wade, and he built this prototype, and we, the time came for us to test it, to see if it worked, to prove if it worked or not. And so 
God isn't wanting to test you to say, I knew it. You were a miserable failure from the beginning. And I wanted to test you just to show you how bad you really are. And if that's your attitude, you really don't know God, first of all. Because God really, the Greek word here, and I don't want to say it, dokimian, is testing to, in order to prove. God wants to test you not to make you hard, not to make you squirm, not to enjoy you squirming. God wants to test you so that you know him and that your faith is proven real. And that's why we must go through various testings of our faith. It reveals whether your faith is good and real or if it is false. And you will not know yourself. I think God knows. I think he knows the heart. And I think that's why Job is having a conference with the main angels. And they're all coming before him. And Satan appears with the angels. And God says to him, Satan, where have you been? He says, well, to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for people whom I can devour. And he said, hey, have you considered Job? And uh no thanks. <laughs> I, I don't like it when, I don't like the fact that God would say, you know, have you considered Job? You should go after him because he's a righteous man and I know his heart is good. And he goes, well, you think his heart's good, but you let me take away his wealth and blessing. You put a hedge around him and nobody, we haven't been able to get to him because you've got this hedge around him and you won't let that. And my mother used to pray, oh God, put a hedge around my children. Any of you pray that? I pray that all the time. Put a hedge, please. Leave me not into, you know, and I want this hedge around me. But there's this time when Satan has gained access to test Job. And uh, God is not moved. He's not threatened. And he says, oh, you should go after Job because I know his heart and it's good. And Satan's saying, well, I know his heart is, it looks good. But if, I, if you let me at him and take away all that you've blessed him with, he'll curse you to his face. And God says, no, you don't know Job like I know Job. And so Job goes through this horrible test. And he is sitting down. He's lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his herds. He's lost his, his housing. And he's sitting in a pile of burned out ashes. And he said, the Lord has given to me and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And God says, see, I told you so. His faith has been tested, and now it's proven. And so he goes after him some more. And the more he's tested, the more he's proven to be the real thing. Now he stumbles and he falls like all of us humanoids, but he has proven to be the real thing. He just doesn't have a knowledge about God, and he's questioning God. God, if you could only come down and we could talk this out, I, could, I know I could convince you. And God just stays distant. But he knows in Job's heart, no matter what's going to come at Job, Job's going to handle it because he knows Job's heart. But Job doesn't know his heart. Satan doesn't know his heart. And I believe a lot of times we're tested because we don't know our heart. Other people don't know our heart until we are tested and then we're proved. Now, our heart is also, our faith is also tested to produce patience. Now, never pray for patience. You're going to be tested whether you pray for it or not, but... Uh, I know God well enough to not pray for patience. If you don't, go for it. You'll know him better um, if that's what you're wanting to do. I, I have enough testing without praying for it. And he says here, look at what it says in verses uh, three, and four, uh, three and four. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result. I like that, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, testing does a couple of things. It proves it true, and it also, um, it also produces maturity and grows you up. And notice what it says in 4, and let endurance have its perfect result. When you're being tested, um, if you're like me, I am often like Christ in the garden before he surrenders, I am asking God for ways out. Is there any other way? And, uh, but I know what it's doing is producing an endurance. It's producing something. If I embrace the trial instead of trying to fix the trial, I know something is going to happen. 
I'm going to gain endurance. I'm going to gain pers perspective. I'm going to gain knowledge of God. And it's let, it's, it's, if any of you lacks, with, uh, if, but let endurance have its perfect result. You can resist the wisdom and you can resist the perseverance that God wants to give you by not embracing the trial. And so we're commanded to have a joy about it enough to where you can embrace it and you can get a joy about it and you can get perspective about it and you can see the end result of it that you're going to be proven that you're going to know God better and that you are going to remain gracefully under this and it's going to produce for you patience and endurance. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's an endurance race. And you and I, as we follow God, we must realize that trials come. We don't have to like them, but we embrace them. And when we do, God shows up and he proves himself to you and to me. He proves your faith is real. He leaves this mark of endurance. And it's almost as if God shields you and he gives you baby trials at first until you grow, until you can handle more. And God grows you up by various trials throughout your life. And it is the normal Christian experience. But remain gracefully under that and let it have its work. Let it have its work. Embrace it. And then our, taste, our, our faith is tested to mature us, that we would be perfect and complete, it says. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Uh, what does your faith lack? Well, I, I don't know. But I know God knows, and I know that God knows how to mine out of me and grow me in a way that I do not know how to grow myself. I know that God wants to know me and me to know him deeper than what I do now, and so he allows these things to come so that I might know him, that I might embrace these things, that he might test me and prove me, and that he might grow me up in my life. So that I could be perfect and complete. Now, think about it. If you are actually praying that God would use you in the workplace, in your family, in some sort of ministry, if you're actually praying for that, God wants to make you perfect and complete so you have something to give and to speak into other people's lives. You know that that's going to require you to know God. It's going to require you to be proven. It's going to require you to embrace trials so that you can know who you are, who God is. You can know your own weaknesses. Peter didn't know his own weaknesses until he failed. And when he failed, he knew God better. He knew his weaknesses better, and he could then minister to people like himself. As he writes in Peter, he says, Now be careful. Satan is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How do I know that? Well, he devoured me. I was sifted like weed. And I came out wanting. But I'm not despairing my own failure because I know that God is working something in me. And he's producing something in me that I may be perfect and complete, that I may live out my call and my race. And I may complete my race because I know God. I've learned something about myself and I'm walking this thing out so that I can minister to other people in a more complete way. And God requires each person to go through testing so that you might be perfect and complete in how you minister. Now, can you imagine someone really hurting and going to someone who has not walked through a lot of stuff? And what do you do? You give them pet answers. And my wife and I were talking on the way to Illinois about um, some failure that, um, that we had had with a couple uh, and we had not walked where they had walked. And we kind of said, well, you should do this. And, uh, and we said, no, you should do that. And it's like, then we realized after the fact, you know what? We've never walked where this couple's walked. We've never been there. And we made this harsh thing because we were not perfect and complete in our ministry because we've not walked where they've walked. And we need to give time and, and place and respect for people who are being tested. We need to give that so that they can know God and minister to me because they've walked in a place that I've never walked. That we might be perfect and that we might be complete. That's why God allows this. He wants people to minister his grace, his mercy, his, his understanding of who he is and how he works with people and situations. 
And if you were God, wouldn't you want to send someone that's really hurting to someone who could really help them, who is perfect and complete because they've been somewhere and they've learned something about God and who they are? Wouldn't you want somebody in pain to go to someone who's just not going to, you know, give them the pet answer? No, God wants to raise up people to be perfect and complete, to be mature. And notice what it says in 5 through 8. That's the purpose for testing. Now we see the need that we have in testing for wisdom. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously, without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, in the midst of testing, you're in the midst, and you're Job, and you're Jesus, and you're wrestling with God. What are you going to do? The best thing to do is like, I don't know how to handle this, God. And come to him and say, God, I really don't know how to deal with this. I've got this situation. I'm being unjustly treated. How do I deal with this? And the answer may surprise you. Um, And I want to say, I I like the the word, this is a big word here. It says, but if any man lack wisdom. One of the things that you realize after you've walked with God and you've gone through some testing and trials and you've proven God and you know God, you're more perfect and complete, there are trials that I go through sometimes that I don't even have to pray about because I don't lack wisdom. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember. And you go, this is what I'm to do, and you do it. You don't lack wisdom, so you don't need to ask. But there are times when you don't know what to do. And it's at those times that God's saying, you know what? You're really going to get to know me when you ask me for wisdom. And I'm going to give you some wisdom And the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to get to know who I am uh, because many people going through trials, and I've watched throughout the years, I've watched something happen with people praying for wisdom that um, I can tell if they're mature or if they're not mature by how they pray. And I don't mean to pick on people and say, oh, you're not praying right or anything. You're praying with what you know, and that's okay. God takes you from where you are, but he's going to grow you up. But it says here that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. What is your view of God when you pray? Is it like, oh, God, you know, I'm in this situation. Please, you know, what can I do? And you're begging God, and, you, and you're like, and, but you don't really think he's going to answer you, so you pray louder. Anybody know that story? And it's, 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 it's like the little kid, he's praying for a bicycle, and he doesn't get it, and he, he prays, and he says, God, it, I didn't get it, so I guess I got to do something more. So if you give me a bicycle, I'll help the old lady cross the street, go get groceries, and I'll bring them back for her, and he doesn't get his bicycle. So he prays again, and he, he thinks God doesn't really want to give me wisdom. So now I got to deal with God differently, and you got to start bargaining with God. You know, you bargain with God to get what he wants, because you can manipulate God if you bargain right. You know this, right? So his mother noticed that the statue of Mary had disappeared. And he says, son, did you see the statue of Mary? Where is he? He says, I hid it. Why did you do that? I told God if he ever wants to see his mother alive again, he will give me that bicycle. (laughs) And, and, And we laugh because that's a cute story. But you know, how many times do I ever pray and I do... I try to bargain with God, and you're trying to get God to do what you want him to do, and what, what's that cause? Why do you do that? Why do we do that? Because we really don't think God wants to give us generously. We don't see God as generously wanting to give it, and we don't see God as wanting this more than we want it, and so we're begging, we're pleading, we're bargaining, you know? It's like the guy in the Old Testament. He says, God, if you give me this battle, the first thing that comes out of my house, I will kill. And his daughter, his only daughter, walks out. That man did not know God. He was bargaining with God, trying to get God to do what God did not really want to do, but he had to do because you drove a hard bargain. Oh, yeah? 
And the thing that I find is that in trials, we really see how much we know God because we're using bargaining. And we're thinking that God really does not want to give me this wisdom. And so I've got to beg him. I've got to shout louder to him. I've got to pray more. If I get 18 people signed up that they'll pray for me, then I'll get what I want. And, and can I tell you that bothers me, prayer list, like that? It, tell me to pray. That's fine. Uh, and then I get prayer lists to tell me how to pray. Pray that I will get my visa so I can go. And it's like, well, God, your will be done. <laughs> well, don't pray like that. I don't want you to pray then. And we find out that people don't really believe that God wants to really answer prayer. And so they pray like it. Their view of God is seen in how they pray. And I find myself, sometimes I say, do I even know God? Look, listen to me, Pray. It's revealing really where I'm at with God. I don't really believe that God wants it more than me, and so I'm begging, and I'm pleading, and I'm getting, if I get 500 people praying for me, God's got to do it, right? And I'm not against prayer. Honestly, I'm not. I just don't think that God's going to hear me because I have 500 instead of one person praying. Or else Jesus was in trouble in the garden. His disciples wouldn't pray with him. But he pushed through, didn't he? And it's almost like sometimes in these testings and trials, it's almost like all your friends are separated from you and only you and God are there because God has worked things so that it's you and him alone. You can't depend on other people. And one of the things in trials, we want to lean heavily on other people. And sometimes it's good. You get wisdom from other people. But sometimes God's going to isolate you and say, nope, this is you and me. Other people, if you're, if you're looking to them, you're going to be disappointed. And this is a time with you and me. Let's do it. Let's do it. And uh, that's where sometimes we find ourselves in these things. If you lack wisdom. Now, God's willingness, he gives generously. Look at God's attitude about you asking him. Listen to what it says. Let him ask of God who gives to all men generously without reproach, and it will be given. You don't know? Pray. God wants it more than you. Why? Because he wants you to have wisdom more than you want it. And the thing that really blocks me from getting wisdom sometimes is because I want God to work on my terms and he has a higher way to do it. And uh, it blocks me. And I have to push through like Jesus did in the garden. It's okay. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Where are you at with God is really going to be reflected in how we pray when we need God. Uh, just this week, um, we were coming unglued uh, because uh, there is overrun in the downtown building and we need another $65,000 or something. And suddenly we take the responsibility on ourselves and we start thinking how we can man manipulate things. And uh, it's kind of bad when you're doing that because everybody's got their thing that they think is important and the other person ought to cut back. And uh, you think your thing is more important. And uh, you, you get into this kind of tension. Are you with me? And that's how come people having financial problems in the home, it's, it's one of the number one causes because you, when funds are insufficient, your values come out. And money is just an indicator, right? And so... Uh, we were struggling with this thing, and finally, we just said, let's stop right now and let's pray. And we said, Jesus, you want this, you want the Cenos more than we want it. You've given us this building. It's obvious that you want us to do this. And so we just commit this to you, and we don't know how to deal with this. And so it's your gig. You do it. We take on temporary ownership, and we just surrender it back to you and say, this is your thing. And uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I don't know. I know God's going to provide something. It may not be what I want. But we will have, we'll come out of this with knowing who God is and that God wants this more than us because it's his thing. And having a confidence about that makes you not be tossed about like a wind in the waves. So, oh, no, we, we should just shut down. Then. No, 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 just 
Don't jump to conclusions. Don't get emotionally charged. Turn to God who wants to give you wisdom more than you want it and pray in faith because if God wants to give it and he's generous in giving, why should you be doubting? Oh, but he won't do it. We got to do something. We got to pull some straight. Who do we know? It's like, chill out. God wants us more than you do. And there are times in our lives when God pushes our backs against the wall, and it's, it's on purpose. It's because he wants you to know who he is. He wants to prove to you that you can go to him and ask, Dad, I have a need. It's bigger than me. Can you help? And he goes, I've been waiting for you to ask. I've been watching you get stressed out about this, and you could have just come. Why didn't you just come? And so we say, oh, yes, you're right. We come. And we're asking. But let that, that man think that he's going to receive anything from God who's double-minded and say, yes, God's going to do it. Oh, no, no, no. We'll manipulate. We'll do this over here. And you take it back. And, and Jesus is doing that in the garden. He understands me. And we're, we're, we're there learning about God. We're there learning of the nature of God's giving wisdom to his children who need him so that they might know him. They might have wisdom. And, uh, and we're not being tossed about because we know God wants this. And look at what it says in 9 through 11. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. If you're poor, you don't have a lot. It's okay. Who are you in Jesus? Focus on who you are in Jesus. Do you have a lot of money? Your temptation will be to be self-sufficient. And let the rich man glory in his humiliation. Lord, without you, I am nothing. Because like a flower and grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and the flower falls off. And of its beauty and its appearance is destroyed, so too is the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Later, James is going to say, you come to me and say, if we're going to go to such and such a city and do all this. And he goes, you better say if the Lord wills, because he can cut anything short he wants. So be humble. Count your richness in him, not in your own wealth. And we're going to get more into that in two weeks. And then the outcome of this is verse 12. I love this. I'm going to close with this. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will, see, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The one who perseveres and doesn't give up will receive, get this, will, once he's been approved, now there's this, Time period you go through and you're being tested and you either fail or you succeed. But once you've been approved, you get something. You, what is it? A crown of life. Now, what is this crown of life? I, I'd like to go a little bit more into this. On this side of heaven, I believe it's now. And I believe it's on the other side when we get the judgment seat of Christ, the reward stand where we get our rewards. And... Uh, but 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 says, The God of all comforts who comforts our hearts in hard times. He comforts us in order that we may comfort you. Now what's he saying? You've been tested, you've been approved, and now you have something to give to other people who are in the midst of their testing. You have a crown of life. You know, it's kind of like you've walked with God... You've been under trial, you've embraced it, you've asked for wisdom, he's given generously to you, you've known God because of the trial, and now you come out of that trial and you see other people struggling, you go, oh, don't worry, it's going to be great. Watch what God will do. This is what he did for me. And I can speak into your life now what, with confidence that God wants to grow you up through this time, and this is what God wants to do in the midst of your hardship. And you can just nail it down for that person, oh, I never thought of that. It's like, well, how do you know that? Well, I've been there. I've done that. I've got the crown to prove it. And God wants to give you crowns. He wants to mature you. He wants to make you perfect and complete, that you're lacking in nothing. Why? So you can be self-centered. No, so that you can go to other people who are hurting and speak into their lives, saying, you know, I know this is hard for you. I know that this is not easy. 
but I believe in you, and I believe that this is a test, and if you pass this test, God's going to do this for you, and if you embrace this, and if you welcome this, God is going to produce something in you that you're going to then begin to give to other people. You know that because you've been there. You've been through it. And the crown of life has something to do on this side of heaven. It has something to do with you gaining authority and wisdom by where you've been and how you proved God in your very own lives, giving you an authority to speak into the lives of other people who need to hear that message, who need to see that crown in your life so that they can take hope in their life, in their situation. They can gain perspective because you've been there and you can share wisdom with them that you've never had before that trial. So when you're under trial, guess what? It's not just for you. It's for you to give to other people. I don't know where you're walking. I know where I'm walking. And I know that God wants to not waste suffering, hardship, trials, pains. He wants to do something in me so that I can minister more effectively to other people. And that's what he wants to do for you. I also believe the crown of life is seen in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For momentary light affliction is producing for you what? An eternal weight of glory that isn't even worthy to be compared. And then it goes into 1 Corinthians, um, I think it's 3, 12 through 15 about... There's this wood, hay, and stubble, and there's gold, silver, and precious stone. And when you're in this trial, it's the fire that purifies and burns up the wood, hay, and stubble in you so that the gold, silver, and precious stone is left so that you can give that to other people. And on the day of judgment, our works, all that we've done for Jesus will be seen if we did it in the energy of the flesh and manipulation or if it stands because the eyes of fire that are in Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. He's pictured with eyes of fire, and he looks at your works. And the fire tests your works. And if you did it by the Spirit of God, there's produced in that gold, silver, and precious stone. And he says, welcome into this, and here is your reward. And I believe that there is an eternal reward, but I believe that there is an earthly side to the reward as well to make you perfect and complete so that you might be more effective in ministering to other people. And I hope today that this understanding of what God would want to accomplish in your lives would grab your heart, that you would welcome it, that you would pray through, that you would understand who God is, that you would be approved in this testing, that you say, yeah, I knew it was in you, but until I tested you, you didn't know it yourself. You're going to know me, you're going to know yourself, and through this testing, you're going to have something to give to other people. And that's the heart of God in all of us going through hardships and trials. So when you're in these times and in these places, you can welcome them. You can turn to God and you can know God better by asking for wisdom. And that's what I want to share with you today. Thanks, Father for how you modeled for us the willingness to the point of death, the shedding of blood. So now here we are, Father. We need you. We welcome you to come in the midst of our trials to show us who you really are. Come among us as we sing this song. Let us embrace the thing that you've put in our path that we may gain from the trial that we face, we pray. Amen.